Hi, everyone. My name is Roni Firon, and this is The Bigger Picture, where we sit down with experts to hear about their journeys, their insights, and the big ideas that drive them. Stay tuned for today's episode. Dr. Oli Dunn is one of my favorite teachers and has been a huge inspiration for me and many others. She has a huge heart, boundless optimism, and is impeccable with her words. Oli studies psycholinguistics, which is the meeting place between psychology and linguistic studies. In particular, she researches how language can affect our attitudes, emotions, and responses. We spoke today about the research she's done in the field of conflict resolution and negotiations, where she and her colleagues have shown that different wordings, often very subtle, can have a substantial impact on how we perceive different texts and messages. It's incredible how much our language and the words we choose to use shape our reality and our interpersonal relationships. Language is this miraculous human instinct, and it's such an integral part of our experience that we often take it for granted. So I hope this conversation will help shed some light on some of the different aspects of language, like how it works, how we acquire it, and how it affects our thoughts and our reality. Stay tuned. Hi, Orly. Hello, Ronnie. Good to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I'd like for you to tell the audience a little bit about your background, especially the fact that, you know, you moved around a lot. Right. And just kind of what impact that had on you. Okay, so um, I'll make it short because it's a short uh, interview Um, for a long life. um, (laughs) I was born in the United States, in Washington, D.C., to a diplomat or uh, actually a Mossad uh, uh, agent. who came from from Berlin. Uh, it's important to mention because I, I feel that, you know, although I lived in many places, which I will uh, say state in a minute, um, Berlin was always uh, there. Okay. Uh, Berlin was in the background. B- Berlin was in the background, very much in the education and also language. We, we spoke German as well at home. Um, so, so I was born in Washington, D.C., and uh, after a few years, we moved to, uh, to Germany. And um, there we lived for five years. Um, it was actually the first uh, embassy to open, uh, Israeli embassy to open in Germany. Oh, wow. Um, so it was very... Uh, and your dad was part yes, of that. Yes, definitely. And that was very exciting. And um, and then we moved back to Washington. Uh, at the time, uh, Itzhak Rabin was the ambassador um, okay. in Washington. And oh, wow. uh, it was also very, very interesting. And then we moved to Sweden, to Stockholm. Uh, there my father was the, the ambassador. Um, and uh, just... just going through the places right and then we moved to um to uh israel actually for well i i came to do i i, I joined the army okay um i actually and and uh i was here for a while uh, it was very important for me to to join the army and actually learn hebrew wow you learned hebrew at 18 well actually at 17 i i was here I, I came a bit earlier. I went to high school for a year in order to to try and uh, adjust. Okay. Uh, it was not easy. It was very oh, no. difficult. <laughs> very different cultures. It was not easy at all. Yeah. And I didn't know Hebrew really. I mean, I understood some, but uh, we, 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 we spoke very little Hebrew at home. Amazing. Just for the audience to know that you have fluent Hebrew with not a uh, trace of an accent, which is incredible to, to have learned it at 17. I think it's probably because of the army. You know, yeah. when yeah. you join the army, uh, you have no choice. Yeah, especially yeah it's the, being thrown into the deep uh, end. Exactly. <laughs> Although, Although, you know, funnily enough, or or maybe not, um, in the army I was speaking, I was using my languages. 
You really? Know, I, okay. I was in the intelligence force, and I hardly, I hardly okay. used Hebrew. Like, like father, like, father, like exactly. daughter. Exactly. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> and uh, so I basically used, you know, my English and 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 German, and maybe a little bit of uh, the languages that that I know. Um, Hebrew was actually in the background, but still, it's the place to to learn a language. If you know, it, it's it, you immerse yourself in in the whole setting of of being in a in a. In a military base which is hebrew speaking so yes yeah of course so you bounced around a lot growing up and you were exposed to a lot of languages and i'm hearing this theme of uh, languages being a, a prominent part of your life how how do you feel that your childhood uh affected your interest in language well first uh, i will say that it wasn't something that I was aware of as a child, clearly. Right. You know, I was aware I was aware of the fact that I was saying goodbye to to friends and and then after a week making new ones. Basically, I lived in one place maximum five years. Wow. because um, also after the army, my 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 father, my parents moved to New York and then to Switzerland. so it was it was it was it was a continuous process. But um, so I wasn't aware of the language issue so much as the cultural issue and the social issues. Right. I mean, I but think I, you learn to adapt yes. uh, very well. Uh, what What would you say are the benefits of moving around a lot uh, as a child? So, so clearly, in retrospect, you know, I can say that that one of the benefits is is this ability to adjust and basically wherever you place me even now I will adjust you know no matter what the culture is the the social habits and and traditions and of course language right because just you know I just want to learn more and more so languages so in that sense yes this ability to adjust is I think a gift yeah it's yeah. like being able to be the new kid on the block right yes every time yeah, yeah. And being comfortable everywhere with it. Um, but I will say that maybe the downside, yeah. although, you know, I'm saying downside, but I'm not sure it's true, even as I speak. I was going to say the downside is the fact that you don't really have one identity. Right. And it, it maybe relates to what we'll talk about later on when we speak about the relationship between between language and the mind. But this this multi, you know, multilingual um, reality uh provides also multiple identities. Right. I think it um, makes the idea of, I think we all need to establish our identity, right? And understand who we are as we grow up. And I think there's an added challenge when you have so many cultures, when your narrative is not, uh, doesn't follow the regular script, right? Where you don't have the regular script of one hometown and this is how everybody is here and this is what everybody believes. All of a sudden you need to, you know, see how all of these different cultures, how do they interact with each other within you, right? And how each one influenced you and it creates a very unique identity in that sense. Right. I mean, I, I said downside because today is so important, as you said, to, to um, or at least people feel that it's important to have an identity, to know who they are, you know, uh, those who don't are in search for one, etc. And as I was listening to you, I thought to myself once again, that's why I said before that I'm not sure downside is the right yeah. word, that it could also be an, uh, you know, a great advantage, this feeling of multiple identities not being connected to one particular identity and uh, shifting maybe even from one to the other, right? you know, on a daily basis. So I think, it's maybe also an upside. No, of course. I think, f first of all, with everything, there's a good and a bad side. And if anything, here it's an added challenge. Right, an added challenge that you need to kind of um, consolidate, consolidate all of these different cultures. But it definitely has a huge upside if you're able to to resolve that within yourself. Amazing. So you were exposed to all of these different languages and slowly, slowly becoming aware that this is a, a, a tying theme in your life and something that's pulling you. And after the army, how how did that show? How did that? Yeah. Well, well, my love of languages was definitely uh, apparent by then, and uh, as you said, and um, and I I knew I was I was into not only languages but into words, 
into literature, into poetry, into you know the art of uh, the art of articulation and uh, and rhetoric and and so on. I, I understood that uh, this was my my great love. So I uh, studied um, English literature, um, undergraduate studies in uh, Tel Aviv University, and um, and then I said to myself, well, you have to be a bit more. Um, practical, so I studied history. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I loved it as well. Um, I suppose it has to do with this love of, of you know, this, this multicultural, multilingual, international perspective that I, that I have. So I love history as well and understanding the, you know, the roots of, 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 of identity. Right, giving you a zoomed out um, perspective on yeah. the world. Yeah, exactly. And then after these two undergraduate degrees, I realized, I really, really realized that I have to be more practical and I want to be more <laughs> practical. And I, I wanted uh, language, but I wanted, I didn't want it on its own, okay. linguistics. And there was, there was no real program. Um, there, was, there was not a program that I could relate to in Israel. And I did not want to leave Israel. Um, so I... Combined um, two two fields, psychology and linguistics, okay. and in a way created what is now known as psych- psycholinguistics. I mean, I didn't create the obviously the the domain, but I I created for myself the ability to study both at the same time. And there were courses in uh, psycholinguistics. You know, even if they were not called psycholinguistics, they were. And um, so, so my degree was was a combination of of both of these uh, domains. Okay, so for people who might not be aware, right? We have psychology and we have linguistics. How is psycholinguistics? How does it marry the two? And how is it different and unique from each of these fields? Okay, and 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 also, I will say I'll answer, of course, the question. But before that, I will say that in Israel today, there is a program in psycholinguistics. Okay. Um, and obviously in, in Europe there are, and in the States, there are graduate programs in psycholinguistics. So today it does exist and it's right. even called that. Um, but you so, had to kind of uh, create it for yourself. Yeah, a sort of uh, custom-made uh, master's thesis um, and, and master. Um, so I would say that, you know, psychology is the study of, 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 of our psych, right? And, and, and cognitive and, and mental and emotional processes, human beings. Um, linguistics is the study of language. It's very, it's a very broad spectrum, uh, but well, both are. Psychology clearly is and linguistics as well. You know, it's not only the actual words, but of course the, the rhetoric and the style and the, and the framing and the putting, putting the words together. And, and also, you know, there's applied linguistics, with, which actually takes the words apart and, and so on. So there, there are many fields within linguistics as well. But my interest is is in this combination, what we call psycholinguistics, which is basically the study or the relationship between language and thought, language and the mind. Um, it's a two way street. You know, how does uh, language influence our thought, and how do our thoughts uh, influence uh, the use of our language? Um, and and this two way street is is uh, I would say uh, reflects. Um, the two main approaches to to psycholinguistic thought, and I can talk about that if you like in a few yes, minutes. Yes, of course, of course. But just for the definition's sake, it's a it's a relationship between language and thought, and language and the mind, which also encompasses, you know, subtopics such as uh, language acquisition, first language acquisition, second language acquisition, multiple language acquisition. Um, uh, of course, language disorders and and and, and disabilities, uh, developmental uh, linguistic develop you know uh, processes in the child, and all this is 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 a whole domain, right? Um, and all of this is nested under psycholinguistics. All of this because it it requires the mind, obviously as well. Right. What and, domain within psycholinguistics most interests you? Uh, the domain of of language as shaping, molding, influencing, creating, etc., our our thought processes, our perceptions, whether 
It's uh, perceiving our internal reality or external reality, whether it's subjective or objective. But the way the use of words influences the way we process our thoughts, the way we create our thoughts. That's the... Amazing. So you mentioned that basically this two-way street between language and thought and that there's two schools of or two camps, right, of uh, how they see this relationship. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the first camp, as you say, is uh, linguistic realism, which basically states something very, very simple that which we can all relate to and understand that uh, language reflects our thoughts. So, you know, I can, I can now uh, um, describe through the use of, of words uh, the, the, the picture that, I, that I'm looking at now of, of uh, you know, Seinfeld and his friends. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm depicting reality. Um, you know, needless to say, it's, it's, it's objective because I'm looking at a photo, but it could also be subjective because I could maybe perceive this photo differently than, than you but it's 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 a reflection of of what I see, and that's 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 you know linguistic realism. It's it's a, it's it's the first camp. The second camp is linguistic relativism or determinism, which uh, which was introduced uh, by Sapir uh, and Worf together, which is known as the Sapir Worf hypothesis. Any I think any student of psychology and any student of linguistics, and even education. And probably neuroscience, uh, you know, every it, we all studied uh, in some shape or form the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which basically states that it's language that creates our reality. It 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 uh, builds the conscious, our conscious, it, our unconscious. We would not be able to to think without words, because this ability to create thoughts and ideas is because we know how to actually add one word to the other and and by that create a sentence which represents a thought. Right. And that's a really strong statement to say yes. that our language basically shapes the way we perceive the world. Right. But um but if you I mean if you think about it it's also very simple to right. uh, concept because because as as I speak now the listeners are thinking about what I'm saying and you know, whether they agree or not, they're using words in order to actually think about what I'm saying. They're in dialogue with themselves now, thinking about the words that I have used in order to express uh, this uh, perception. And they're processing these ideas by using the words they have access to. They would not be able to be in this inner dialogue with themselves about what I just said without the words that they have access to, without this bulk of vocabulary. Right. Can you can you give us a little bit of an example of maybe how how did Sapir and how did Worf come to this conclusion? Right. What um, what did they find that made them made them come to this conclusion of our language? Our base is basically the building blocks of how we think. So therefore, language uh, affects our perce perception, how we perceive the world. I, I will. I will. Yes, definitely relate to that. Although I think that's the weak. The weakest part of the theory okay. is the um, is their inability at the time. This was in the 1920s, 30s, to actually provide what we call today, you know, empirical uh, evidence. Ev exactly, evidence-based uh, conclusions or or right evidence-based you know results that we can actually uh, you know that are tangible in that sense in the in the academic sense in the scientific sense they they were not able to do so they they had uh, they did try some you know they 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 tried to um study tribes uh that have labels for particular colors and only for those colors and they tried and they asked themselves whether the the population or the speakers of these tribes can actually perceive colors like speakers that have more labels for a larger scope of colors. They tried doing that um, unsuccessfully because they actually, they, they were not able to, to establish their theory uh, with uh, this research because they actually found that 
you know, those people that don't have, let's say, the label for the color blue were still able to, to say that the color of the sky is the same as something that had the same color, even though they didn't know what the blue. word was. Right. They could distinguish it. They could distinguish. However, today, using, you know, using um, uh, much more advanced uh, machinery, I would say, mm -hmm. device devices, scientific uh, devices, research has shown that, for example, children who have the word trelet for light blue, as opposed to in Hebrew, as opposed to English speakers that have light blue, the, the Hebrew speakers were able to distinguish the trelet, the light blue color, better than the English speakers. Right, faster, faster reaction time. Faster times. reaction time and even, even a better perception of the actual color. So, so maybe the fact that... Um, you know, today we are living in this uh, world that has uh, light blue and uh, dark blue and navy blue and sky blue and uh, sea blue and all sorts of names for colors. We know that when we go to buy, uh, when we want to paint our right, house. There's a cornflower. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and cerulean, I think, is also a blue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. There's so many names. And uh, and today we are, we are more uh, aware of these uh, subtleties Perhaps that, that is because we have these variations in, 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 in labeling of colors. So that's yeah. one example. Yeah, and I think if, um, you know, you learn a specific jargon of a certain field, right, whether it's psychology or uh, business uh, language or uh, law, you start to, these things from your field become more salient to you in your environment, right? Like you start to see everything through that lens. Um, exactly. And, and the language there is partly what enables you to see these things and to be able to distinguish them where beforehand you wouldn't, you wouldn't even notice these things. Exactly. It's not in the scope of thought. That's the point, right. actually. That the moment you don't have the, the vocabulary that you have access to, you know, in your memory, then it's not in your scope of thought because you're unable to... To, you know, it's not tangible. Right. There's something in the label yes. that is able to access, access your thoughts and your memories and exactly. uh, the different associations that you have with this word. And Exactly. And so they actually took it to an extreme and said that, you know, a German speaker does not think the same as an English speaker. Right. So, okay. And we, we spoke about these two camps. Where do you find yourself? Who, who do you agree with most here? So I will say uh, before that that um, yeah. that uh, you know today it's very uh, it's very modern and trendy to be eclectic, and and okay. and and it's it's the, it's it, for a reason to because, take a little bit of this because and that. exactly because right. you know nothing is we know t we know as scientists that nothing is totally uh, reliable or credible or valid you know there, nothing can be totally 100% valid and there are always irregularities and so on so it's very fashionable to be eclectic and 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 probably for a good reason um i think anything and, that's extreme exactly, is problematic exactly so so in line with what you just said i i i, I don't think anyone today adopts the deterministic view of language determines thought and that's the only thing I would say that the camp that I can relate to is the relativist camp, which says that language influences our thought. Probably the, the most prominent factor that influences our thought, but not the only one. Okay. So the relativist approach takes into account that there are other factors at play aside, you know, language, but language is the prominent uh, factor. And this is definitely the camp that I uh, okay. adhere to. So, you know, we've... Um, throwing this word around language, but I kind of want to go even deeper into the fundamentals of it. And what makes human language unique, you know, versus um, other forms of communication that we might see that animals have? Like what, what about language uh, really differentiates uh, us? And, and if language influences thought, then there's a relationship between this tool of language and our cognitive development, right? Right, right. So I, maybe I'll answer on two levels. Yeah. Um, so I think I'll start actually with um, 
by answering your question, which is, uh, you know, what, what differentiates us from other creatures, right? I mean, how are we different in that sense? Um, and I think that, and I'm not obviously the only one that, that thinks this, uh, so many philosophers have been uh, discussing this throughout, uh, you know, in the last uh, decades or so. Um, we have a, an, Isra uh, an Israeli one, Noah Harari, who, who speaks about the fact that we are the strongest living creatures on the planet because we have language. Because of our storytelling abilities. Right. The right. storytelling and also, you know, we are, we are, we are able to, to create revolutions and, and wars and peaceful um, negotiations and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, because we have language, because we are thinkers, because we are able to share our thoughts with other people, and this is what gives us our strength. Unlike any other creature that is unable to do so, and even, you know, if we... I always have the students that ask me about the dolphins and the whales and so on. Right. Yes, they have a sophisticated form of communication, but they are not able, you know, they are unable to, 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 to create peaceful negotiations among two nations speaking different languages. Right, so they don't, it's, it's not... Right. Yeah, they don't go to war for Helen of Troy, for instance. Exactly. Right? There's exactly. something about right the the conflicts that you see uh, animals have that are very survival based. Right. It's over territory. It's over <laughs> it's over uh, partners. It's over food and resources and things like that. And we have managed with language, right, to reach these levels of abstraction. Everything comes down to survival. It's in some form or exactly. another, right? If we have an evolutionary psychology point of view. But we, our, our storytelling ability and our language basically allows us to have these levels of abstraction where you can go to war uh, based on an idea, right? Exactly. Based on principles, based on, and what are ideas we do. if not uh, yeah. language based? Yes. Yes. So, so, so that's definitely, I mean, language is, is when, when people say that language is the most powerful tool, mm -hmm. you know, they think about, um, about the, uh, they, they actually understand, at least on a certain level, uh, that that it's the it's the one thing that differentiates us between uh, from from animals, from other living creatures. Uh, but it's it, but the sentence has so much more to it, right? It's uh, right. I think we take uh, language for granted because it's so embedded in us. Exactly, it's a natural. It's an instinct. Steven Pinker calls it an instinct. We're born with it just like we have to breathe and drink and eat in order to survive. Language is an instinct. Right. And it's, you you speak about this idea of language acquisition versus learning and right. this instinct of just acquiring the language. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Sure. So, so basically what it means is that a, a, a baby cannot actually decide, you know, consciously, voluntarily decide not to acquire the language, right? It happens whether he or she likes it or not. It's a natural, innate ability. And um, this acquisition, this, this term that you mentioned, is a natural process, an innate ability that we're born with, which is usually sort of comes to its complete uh, you know, uh, manifestation of language at about the age of six of course, it 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 develops uh, throughout our life. We learn new words every day, whether right. we're, whether we know it or not. But but this actual ability to to use language and comprehend language is 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 goes on till the age of five or six. Um, and and so, and this is a natural process, and it doesn't matter whether we're born to a rich family, a poor family, an Indian family, a Swedish family. A uh, family that has two fathers or two mothers, five brothers and six sisters. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We will acquire our first language, what we used to call mother tongue. Now it's not politically correct, but right. This, why not? Why, why, why not? Is it, why is it Im, Im, because, not political? Because we may have two fathers. And then, I see. And then, I see. Uh, so the mother tongue is no longer. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. No longer <laughs> suitable. But um, but so that's acquisition. And that happens uh, whether we like it or not. It's a natural process. Versus learning. Learning is, is, uh, is a conscious, um, formal, 
structured process. So the, and the older we get, uh, you know, the, we, we choose what we learn. Right. Um, the more difficult it becomes and, as well. And, well, that's, that's a, regarding language, it's a question. Um, um, we know that children are better at acquiring accents. Okay. We know that children, so meaning phonology and phonetics, they are, they are better because, and it apparently has to do with, with the structure of their ear, something physiological, not, mm -hmm. not something uh, philosophical. And, um, and they're also, and this is, this is what's interesting, they're also better in grammatical structures. They're better in acquiring grammar. They're better in learning grammar. They're better, purposely I'm using both of these concepts, they're better in um, identifying grammatical errors from a very, very, very young age. And apparently this has to do with Chomsky's... Yes, I was, uh, I was hoping we would get to that. Yes, Good. this has to do with Chomsky's nativism. Right, right. He has this um, universal uh, grammar. Right? Exactly. And, and, you know, it means, it, it, it means something more than what it sounds. Okay, universal right. grammar basically means that if we translate it into today's terms mm -hmm. and understanding, uh, universal grammar means that we are born with this network, with this ability, that, right? Our, our brain, our neurons are able to connect in such a way that we can actually structure a correct grammatical sentence from the age of three, or even you know, this is this is this is amazing, right? And and a child at the age of four can already identify mistakes and correct them and so on unconsciously. So it's this inherent, basically, kind of the building blocks. And we as as children, we hear a language and. The, the pieces fit, right? Exactly. Okay. They fit because we are, um, as you say, we are, we are, it, it is embedded. Our brain is, is, is wired. That's the word I was looking for. Right. In such a way that it can create these grammatical structures easily. Right. There's, I, I just heard, um, you know, Google Translate. So, yes. So what they did basically is they let Google Translate uh, learn all the languages and, in, and it, they found that instead of translating a language like French, for instance, to English, like uh, direct one to one, what the algorithm, the translating algorithm does is it created this kind of meta language mm -hmm. and it translates from the language you asked for to the meta language and back to the second language. Yes. And and it's basically they're kind of calling it, you know, um Chomsky's universal grammar, this right. meta language that right. that, that Google, Google knows how to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot, lot, lot to say about translation. I don't know if we'll get into that uh today, but um but yes, it's it's um it's uh children have this ability. Right. Uh, and um also, children have an advantage because of what we call less is more. You know, okay. they are they little are little bits right. that they're getting. They're they're they're. I, I don't know if it's little bits, so, but it's it's the idea that they're they have less knowledge, less information, less experience, and and which serve as noise. Right, right, right. To adults, you know, the more we know, the more noise in quotations, right? We have. And in a way, the, the, the over-information interferes with this natural process. Um, however, I will say something important and also, you know, uh, providing hope to our <laughs> older listeners that, and when I say older, I mean above the age of, uh, of uh, you know, of uh, six, six right? Six years I'm old not, of the critical I'm period. Not saying, yeah. I'm not saying, uh, or 12, okay? Not, not uh, older than 12. Okay. Um, that the the older uh, learners and acquirers both have an advantage for the same reason that I just stated as a disadvantage. Or in other words, the fact that there is this platform of knowledge and that we have reference points. We have we have words that we can refer to when learning new words. The fact that we have this knowledge is actually to our advantage. So 
So the 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 what what uh, evidence supports is that adults have an advantage in terms of vocabulary, in terms of learning and or acquiring <clears throat> sorry new vocabulary. Okay. And so so we can sum it up by saying that children are um, you know have an advantage in phonetics and in grammar, mm-hmm. and adults in vocabulary. And vocabulary. Okay, so there's hope. There's there hope is if you want to learn hope. a new language. That's good to know. So, okay, within your work in psycholinguistics, you you do a lot of research around how different uh, language, how different um, structuring of sentences, for instance, can shape the perception of the other side, right? And done this in terms of also negotiations and also conflict resolution. So can you tell us a little bit about the basically the ideas behind this and give us a few examples of studies that you ran? Sure, I'll, I'll do that with pleasure. And I think that as a platform of knowledge, I'll, um, in order to, to, um, to help explain the, 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 the basic uh, school of thought that we mentioned before of language influencing our thought processes, Let, let's take as an example something that everyone can understand okay. um, without being an expert in, uh, in psycholinguistics, the, the future tense, mm-hmm. okay? Or the whole concept of tenses. And, and I'm giving this example on purpose because it has to do with what we just said about grammar. So it's, it's the, the whole concept of tenses basically states, right? The, the idea of a tense is that we are able to consciously differentiate between periods of time, right? So we are told from a very young age that there is a past, there is a present, and there is a future. And not only that, we're taught in school, well, it, it, formally, right? Mm-hmm. We learn, and, are, and, and, and naturally as children, we, we are being told that there is a language for that, right? There is a language that helps us differentiate between the past and present and the future right. yesterday right? tomorrow the days of the week these are right these are temporal phrases but what about the actual grammar right right I went yesterday right I am today or I sorry I go right I went I go and I will go right okay? so the grammar actually reminds us constantly right uh the time frame which we're in. And to show you how strong that is, you know, how, how, how this language, how the use of, of, of grammatical tenses um, actually influences the way we distinguish and perceive time is, is, is amazing. So, so there's, there's a lot of research, research about language and the perception of time, and it's an entire... You know, it's an entire uh, course, if you like. But I will give just one example before presenting my research just to show you how, how, how these subtleties make such a huge difference. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, regarding the future tense, there are populations in, in the world that don't have a future tense. Right? Okay. Clearly, they have a future. <laughs> they don't have a future tense. It's not in their language. They have past and present. Okay, There is no future tense. How do they get by? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, apparently they get by very well. Not only do they get by very well, they are apparently um, better savers in terms of, of, of money. Okay? They, they save money. They are also... It's counterintuitive. I know. you think that if you had awareness of the future, you would want to save for the future. Exactly. And I'll say something else in answer to what you just said and, and the explanation that, that, you know, was given to this uh, finding. But so they're better savers. They're better. They, they lead um, healthier lives. They eat healthier food. They have safe, safe sex more than uh, futured languages. Um, and, and other, and other uh, uh, findings that I won't go into now because of lack of time. But the explanation for this finding is that if my brain is, is constantly um, tuning out of the future, in other words, I'm not, u- I'm not relating to the future in my, in my use of, of the grammatical tense. I'm in the present. Then I, then exactly. 
my present is much more active in my brain. My present is much more dominant in my scope of thought. And therefore, if I have less money now, I am concerned with saving it and not with, you know, we'll go to Paris next week, even if we don't have money, because later on we'll be able to make more money and somehow compensate for, for this trip. Right. No, we will not go to Paris because we have to, we, we need the money now. And, and it's wow. the, the, the present is so much more more prominent and dominant and and uh, in our in our scope of thought. So yeah, you, you think that they would, you know, like that the future would make us want to save more, but really we can bargain with the future in the sense of we can borrow from it. Like, oh, my exactly. future self will be uh, exactly. will be responsible. But if you're only in the present, then responsibility happens here and now. Exactly, exactly. That's an excellent uh, uh, mm-hmm. explanation. And, you know, and, and the fact that we have to distinguish in our mind between the past, present, and future because we have to use the correct grammatical form, right? This, this, this forces us to realize there is a past, present, and future on a daily basis. So who, who are these people? Yeah, so actually this, um, w- one of the main researchers in this field of, uh, of money and, uh, okay. and, uh, and, and language, he's actually, he's a, he's a, um, He's an economist. Is Keith Chen okay? And um, the culture, the the culture that doesn't have a future. Ah, uh, well, you have Zimbardo studying that. Yes, yes, the same Philip Zimbardo. Okay, uh, that is known for the Stanford uh, Prison Experiment. You have Zimbardo, and you have you but, have but uh, the but the, like, the nation who, who who's like who are these people oh. who don't have the future? Oh, uh, who are the uh, actual people? Well, you have you have uh, certain forms of uh, Sicilian. Dialects really? and Greek dialects and um, and Chinese. Interesting. And, okay. Uh, and uh, well, there are actually there's a there are a bulk of populations that we call them futureless language languages. Um, interesting. And, I never and knew that. It's very interesting. And if you look at them like on a global uh, perspective, from a global perspective, then you can actually see that their national uh, income and and their national budget is is um, I would say uh, healthier than the the populations that have a future tense. Interesting. Okay. So so these subtleties make all the difference, and that's where our research is in. Okay, so okay, so about your research, you, you want to start with the conflict resolution, the negotiations. Um, I'll, I'll start with I think what I'm most passionate about, which is um, which is the role of language um, within the context of political psychology. Okay. More specifically, within the context of intergroup relations, even more specifically, within the context of intergroup con- conflict or groups that are in conflict, and even more specifically. Yeah. Our local, um, our own uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which, which, um, you know, which, which I'm passionate about because, like so many other citizens of Israel and and others, we, we would really like this conflict to be behind us. And um, so, uh, as part of uh, of um, the PICR lab. Mm-hmm. Um, which um, is now at Hebrew University and in the past was at IDC, uh, we carried out research studying the role of language. And what does a PICR stand for? It's the Psychology of Intergroup uh, Conflict and okay. Reconciliation. Okay. Um, in the hope to reconcile and not only to identify the sources of the conflict, but also to, to actually um, create interventions for resolving or at least uh, helping in, in resolving the conflict. And what do you think um, is the role of language in this? Right. So, so you know, taking into account that language is so important, or having established that, I hope, um, we uh, carried out a number of, of experiments, a number of studies. And uh, the one that I, I like the most, uh, we called it... Uh, arose by any other name, mm-hmm. um, you know, relating 
to to one of my favorites, to Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, uh, who who states, you know, Romeo states that no matter what you call a rose, it will always be a rose. And actually, our um, our study shows that this is not the case. That uh, if you call a rose by another name, it is no longer a rose. Or in other words, um, we gave our participants um, items or sentences that um, conveyed um, conciliatory policies regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So an example of a conciliatory policy would be something like, I am for returning to the 67 borders. I am for um, dividing Jerusalem, uh, etc. And we gave half of our participants the form that I just used, I am for dividing, I am for returning, um, which is the verb form. And we also, and we gave the other half of the participants the same items in terms of their semantic meaning. Okay, this is important to understand, mm -hmm. that the semantic meaning did not change. We gave it in the noun form. I am for the division of Jerusalem. I am for the return to 67 borders. In Hebrew, it is more distinct, okay. this different, this different, the difference between the noun and verb forms. And uh, you know, this is a very, very subtle difference. You know, you would think, why should anyone um, perceive this, this, um, this, uh, this conciliatory policy different? whether it's in the noun form of, or the verb form. So clearly the way I'm presenting it, you already understand that, that uh, we did find a significant difference in the way these conciliatory policies were perceived. And um, then there was a difference between the noun form and between the verb form. And, um, you know, we can talk about why this difference exists, yeah. but... But maybe I'll, I'll move on to, to the second experiment, experiment, if it's okay, yeah, okay, based on the first one. Okay. Right? So having established, yes, there is a difference. Yes, it makes a difference. Yes, this subtle difference makes a significant difference in the way this policy is perceived. Now, when I say, I, I, I want to clarify something. When I say the way the policy is perceived, it's basically to what extent do I accept it, right? To what extent am I willing to to divide Jerusalem when I'm using the noun form versus whether I'm using the verb form, whether I'm reading the noun form versus whether I'm reading the verb form, right? So, so the, the level of support of a policy is the way we perceive the policy. And also, how, 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 how am I emotionally with regards to this policy, right? Because clearly emotions have a huge impact on the way we perceive policies, right? Am I, ang am I angrier? Am I, um, am I more hopeful? Am I f more fearful, right? Am, do, I, do I feel a greater extent uh, level of shame or guilt? So, so the first experiment found that um, we are more supportive of conciliatory policies when using the noun form, and we are... We, we, we report lower levels of anger. Okay. And moreover, the, the emotion of anger served as a mediator. So in other words, I want to be simple, right? So I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. using, I'm using my words carefully. <laughs> in other words, the noun form reduced levels of anger towards this policy of, let's say, the division of Jerusalem. And in turn... I, was, I, am, I am more supportive of this conciliatory policy of, let's say, the division of Jerusalem. So this was our first experiment. And based on these results, we, we looked into um, the opposite of conciliatory policies, policies, retaliatory policies. Okay. Right? I am for um, destroying uh, the houses of those um, people involved in, let's say, terrorist attacks, or, um, you know, I am, for, I am for military 
for, for carrying out military actions, right? So it's the opposite of conciliatory. Right. And we also used, we also looked at additional emotions. Um, I'm, I'm simplifying and, and of course, uh, no, of shortening. Course. But we found that um, it works the same, works the same way, right? So, so This idea that, just to just to jump in for a moment, sure. just that language, the bas- basically the language that we use is basically the language that we use affects our emotions and in turn our emotions affect our perception of the situation. Right, right. They, they expect, they, 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 um, the language influences our emotions, it influences our perceptions, and when we look at them, you know, in, in, in the form of, of, if we look for a mediator, then yes, the emotions mediate between the use of language and our uh, perceptions of these uh, policies, whether conciliatory or retaliatory. Amazing. So what, what do you think is, what do you think in the noun form was... Uh, incited less anger. Okay. So, and I, I just want to um, clarify one more thing for, for the listener, because I know I know that, you know, people have asked me, it's clear why there are differences, because if you are, let's say, more conciliatory in nature, you know, let's say you support liberal, left-wing, you know, in Israel um, policies, then of course, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a left-wing, then you are more supportive or conciliatory. However, um, we, we controlled for this, uh, right. for this uh, you know, variable, for this uh, ideological uh, orientation. And, and it's, it's important to state that no matter, you know, no matter what age you are and no matter if you're, if you're, what gender you are and no matter what political ideology you are, um, you know, you adhere to, it works. Okay. Right. So, so there was a difference between noun and verbs. It's important to say this because otherwise you think there's so many other factors at play. But we, you know, as as researchers, as scientists, we 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 know how to how to um, control the variables. How to control for these um, yeah. interfering and 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 variables. Um, how do we explain this? Well, there are two possible explanations, and we we chose one in the end. Um, you know, one explanation based on, of course, previous literature and previous research, which is something that we, we all must do as scientists, one explanation is the difference between um, passive and active. Again, I'm, right. I'm simplifying in my, in my explanation, right? So, so when, when you use the verb form, you are, you are active. Um, there's an active agent behind the action. There's an active, there's, there's someone that is actually carrying out the action. Exactly. Only it is agentic. Mm-hmm. Okay, there is someone carrying out the action um, and it is, it, is, it is someone's responsibility. Um, and more than that, um, it is something that the reader of such a sentence can actually imagine him or herself doing. Mm-hmm. Right, um, it's very, it's very, very much alive. Mm-hmm. Okay, and 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 yes, the magic word here is agency. Right, there's someone to get angry at, also. Exactly, there is someone that you can, you can, you can, uh, you know, that is accountable for this action, and that that's that's very important. Um, the noun is more. I would I wouldn't use the word passive, even though I I did it before. I would actually use the word. It is more stable. Mm-hmm. It is also distant. Right. Um, Something that happened it or is, is happening. But... Right. Is it? It is an entity. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It is. It exists. But there's there's no one person or people that you can account for you know you can say they're responsible they're doing this and and you can you you as a as a thinker as a reader of these words you don't necessarily see yourself doing it because it's very very abstract right it's okay? a something that is happening or is, will happen but right right and that that leads me to the other to the other distinction between abstract and vivid mm-hmm. okay so, you know, I wanted to simplify it. So I, I, I made these, these simpler distinctions than we made in our research. But the idea is that, that 
you 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 so you distance yourself from something that is abstract and you you feel closer to something that is very vivid right, right? concrete and exactly and research has shown that um when we actually use the verb form we see ourselves carrying out the action so even if i if i now you know say something like i'm going to have coffee after this interview i can see myself going right walking in the street entering a specific coffee shop and buying coffee right right um i it's amazing how these implicit little changes in language completely change the way we perceive and I think it really speaks to your example beforehand of the different tenses, right? Of past, right. present, and future, and that we don't even have to say yesterday or tomorrow, but the tense is enough to point to to a certain time, right? And uh, and and in the same way, these different um, different um, the, the verb form and noun form can subtly, but just enough, you know, change the way we react emotionally, and then how we perceive uh, the statement that we're reading. And it's amazing to think that language can have such an impact, and especially because it's so implicit. Exactly. And I want to remind you that these, you know, now the noun versus verb forms are grammatical structures. Again, once again. So they don't have to, they don't deal with future or past or present tense, but they deal with, 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 with a grammatical structure once again. And, um, and, and we're not aware Mm -hmm. of these subtleties as you say they're it's the they're they're very um you know they're implied right. they're not uh they're not explicit and we're not aware we're not consciously aware of them i don't think that uh, even you know until we thought about this uh, research i myself was not aware of what an impact the difference you know that the the use of a noun has as opposed to the use of a verb again stating the exact same semantically, you know, semantic meaning in a sentence. I was not aware of this. Right. I this think is not something we think about. When I read this, I thought of, you know, emailing and how mm, right. how you write an email. And sometimes just choosing the right words can help kind of persuade the other side, right? Just like these little subtle changes. The other side won't even be aware of them, but you're kind of uh, pointing the conversation in, in the direction that you want yes. to. And not only that, you know, um, we all know that um, we we all know that the way we speak to people will will influence our interaction with them. You know, we know this from from such an early age as children, right? How we ask ask something uh, from our parents, right? And and you know, uh, we know this instinctively. Um, and as adults, clearly, we 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 actually manipulate, uh, you know, for better or for worse, people consciously using language we we do this every day probably again not in a negative way uh, no of course but, uh, but still but, um, it, we we shape our interpersonal relationships basically with the language that we use of course but we're not aware of these subtleties right and and, and because there wasn't even a semantic change right the, exactly the, the sentences meant the same thing but just this grammatical structure was Enough exactly. to you know. I am for dividing Jerusalem versus I am for the division of Jerusalem. The the outcome is exactly the same, and and the the meaning of the sentences is semantically the same. So so this is one uh, very interesting and an example which which I love, um, and Maybe. it led us to do other more you know other things. Uh, we've been uh, studying the difference, for example, between um, the way uh, native speakers of Arabic. Um, process the same um, sentence semantically but conveyed either in Arabic or in Hebrew. Okay. So, for example, um, and, and, you know, this is interesting on more than one level because we have what we call conflicting psychs. Mm -hmm. This is the name that, that, we, uh, that we gave it because basically if you think of, of, um, of bilingual um, native speakers of Arabic, that, that, you know, the second language is, is Hebrew, right? And they're totally bilingual. And they live in a Hebrew setting uh, in terms of country, but at home they live in, you know, they're, they're, the microcosmos is, is in Arabic. And, um, and they are thinking in both languages as bilinguals and, you know, interacting constantly with uh, using both languages at the same time. 
However, these languages represent two different cultures, two different points of view, and perhaps two 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 different uh, you know two two different psyches in the sense of in in the context of the conflict, right? So this is an extremely interesting research that we're doing now, and um, right the how the perception of a sentence changes where the semantics is held constant, but whether they receive the the sentence in Hebrew or Arabic. Exactly. And we found, for example, one one finding that I can talk about now is that mm-hmm. uh, we found that in, in relation to pride, um, there is a difference in level. So, for example, okay. you know, I, uh, um, I, I can, it's also, I think, counterintuitive what I'm now going to say, but um, speakers or Arab native speakers um, have higher um, levels of pride regarding their the, the fact that they are Arabs uh, in Hebrew. Okay, and how do you explain that? <laughs> um, well, we're now thinking about it, but uh, what we're thinking about is that um, there's a certain, I would say, level of compensation here, right? Um, you You... Perhaps, as a native Arabic speaker, pride is actually um, related to and closer to the the language that represents higher levels of pride that is dominant in 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 our local setting. And maybe it's it's a kind of psychological you know compensation that uh, I will feel as an Arab and as a native speaker of Arabic higher levels of pride regarding my being an Arab in Hebrew. Because of the contrast, basically. You're speaking a language that isn't associated with you being an Arab, but because you speak Hebrew, the contrast um, creates creates that sense of identity even more. That's, right, that's what you're saying, and and also a a, a desire to I, I I use the word compensation because you you are you in in that way you are compensating, right, um, for your differentness I guess in exactly. the situation, for for being maybe the other, right, in in this broader, you know, setting within our uh, country, right, right. I mean, we spoke about identity at the beginning, and I think uh, we, we're all looking to have a certain identity and to belong. And when you do feel like the other, there is a need to to go back to your identity for a moment, right, and get that anchor. And, uh, and exactly. there is a sense of pride there. Um, exactly. Fascinating, fascinating. It's amazing the research that you're doing and how we're discovering that these little... Li- Little changes, subtle changes in language can have such an impact. And I mean, there's there's still a lot to explore. I do just want to mention one of uh, one of the studies that you guys found, which I think uh, had a really nice uh, conclusion, where you you explored how negotiations right differed when a demand was being made or a polite request. Right, which uh, the the conclusion of it was uh, uh, very appealing to my American side. <laughs> right, we called it in sympathy is all you need, my friend. Right, right. Because because actually, the politer you were, the more um, sympathetic people were towards you and wanted to give you a higher discount and wanted to negotiate with you in I have the future. A question about that: Was the sample Israeli? Okay, so that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. We we so the first study w- was on Israelis, and you know we were we were and, and excuse me for saying this, but we were pleasantly surprised because there is this um, stereotype or this this uh, assumption that Israelis get more when they are tough, uh, tough, and, and when they yeah. are aggressive, and when they demand, and when basically you know the table is turned over, and and apparently this is not the case. And and but we said okay, so now let's 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 study the second study. Um, we looked into a group of international students, okay, um, 
coming from different, uh, you know, diverse range of, of countries throughout the world. And we found this, we got the same result. And in the third study, we said, let's look at Israelis using English. Okay. Having in mind the thought that, you know, um, this is not their native language, right? So what happens when, when, it's, when, it's, when it's your second language or third language? And we found the same result. Amazing. So, so that's what, um, yeah, you know, the, it's very important uh, in research to, 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 to have a, a right, re, re, to replicate, to, to, right. to, to be consistent in your findings. Right. And and so to that make it sure won't be a sam- random finding. Right? Exactly. Exactly. To make sure that your samples um, represent, uh, you know, reality as much as, as much as they can. That's amazing. It's very counterintuitive to our culture again, here. Once again, you know, I want to say this to our um, students, especially that, uh, yeah. you know, that uh, sometimes ask me why study something that is common knowledge or why study something that is so, so obvious. And I, I, I want to say in answer to that, that uh, there is no such thing as obvious in science. Right. And there is no such thing as taking something for granted or common knowledge. You have to actually... Carry out research. And also what's common knowledge for you might not be common knowledge for someone else, right? What someone takes for granted, maybe other people disagree with. So nothing is obvious until really proven right. scientifically. Right. Absolutely. Amazing. And 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 then again we and, and even then we we continue asking and searching and uh Beautiful. So I have a few questions uh, for us to wrap up. I kind of want to circle all the way back. We talked about um, your first degree in English literature. And I wanted to ask you, what role do you feel that literature played in your life? And um, after that, I'd like to know if there were any books, maybe the top three, if you can. If that's too hard, then we can we can lengthen the list a little bit. But um, if, some books that had a real impact on shaping your life. Okay, so first of all, yes, uh, I love I love uh, reading, and it's not only literature; it's also um, it's also uh, poetry. Okay, and um, um, you know this. It, I'll start with poetry. I think this ability to 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 open up an entire world in in a few sentences sometimes, um, and also to incite. You know the reader's imagination and induce so such a wide range of emotions and thoughts, and 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 you know different to to you know it resonates with every person in a different way. So I, I find that amazing, and uh, you know there's not a day that goes by without reading poetry and without uh, hanging on to this uh, this uh, one sentence from a particular poem, and and regarding literature. Um, you're asking me about my 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 favorite book. So uh, first of all, I'll say that I love biographies. Right. Um, I'm now reading um, towards the end of reading Obama's uh, ah. biography. Which I, I will say not not only your favorite, but um, influential. Influential, right? If there were any moments, like any books that um, you can look back on and say, "Wow, that that changed me." Right. So, so I'm, I, 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 I will, I will tell you, and I, I do want to mention by Obama because yeah. I want to say that, um, you know, it's still happening, right? I'm still influenced by by books. Not, not only, you know, I don't have to look back, right? right it's and, not in past and, tense. And, and, <laughs> and yeah, no, exactly. And I, I will mention those, but um, it's important to to give this as an example because I think what's fascinating about biographies is that on the one hand, you know, you learn about history, right? You're learning, you're reading historical, about historical events, but you're getting this personal touch. You know, there's a human being behind all of these decisions and there are interactions between, between, you know, leaders and between, and between negotiators. And these are, these are human beings like, 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 uh, you know, like, like any other human being. So there's a personal story and a narrative behind, behind these historical events. So, so I think that, that really most of the biographies that I read um, influenced me, and if you're asking about past readings, then yes, Winston Churchill. Okay. Um, Why? You know, well, I think he's a, it's a must because you know this was a very complex um, human being, you know, a that's brilliant for sure. leader, um, orator. Mm-hmm. You know, his his use of words 
um, is probably, I mean, I, 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 I can think of a few, you know, uh, or obviously uh, Kikoro, you know, Winston Churchill, Oscar Wilde. You know, I can think of a few that their use of words is, is magical. You know, there's like, there's nothing else like it. You know, no one would have said it in this way. And, um, and I think that reading his biography and his, there's a book about his speeches um, changed, really, I can say that it impact, had a great impact on, on my life. Um, probably led me to study history and to love history and, uh, and also, yeah, and, and reading speeches, fascinating, um, if, if the people actually wrote them, you know. Um, right. And so Winston Churchill is a good example. Um, I would say that um, um, Oscar Wilde's plays had a great impact on me, again, because of this magical, overwhelming, mind-boggling use of words, you know, metaphors and similes. And, and There's something um, you said, you know, about poetry and what it can incite in you, the emotions, the imagination. And I, I was thinking it's like, uh, a poem can transport you to another universe. Exactly. And and what you're saying about, you know, Churchill and Oscar Wilde is that they had this ability to use language in a way that would transport you to a universe. Yes, yes. Take you somewhere else, uplift you, you know, like above and beyond the actual right. uh, word. And um, and uh, if, if uh, we're talking about books that influenced me, then I can talk about Maya Angelou's books. Okay. Which I think... Um, Which ones opened in up, uh, uh, the the bird in the cage. Yeah, um, I think that um, you know the it made me realize or be more sensitive and more aware to 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 this sense of of uh, exclusion. Um, you know, being the other that we spoke about before. There was always the other, so makes it tangible. It makes it tangible, and you you empathize, you sympathize, you want to make sure that people do not feel this uh, feeling of estrangement and discrimination ever again. Um, so that definitely had an influence on, on me. And not only her books, you know, any, any book that dealt with uh, discrimination and uh, racism and prejudice, etc. cetera. Um, so who have we mentioned? Oscar Wilde, Maya Angelou, Winston Churchill, so different, right? About so many, ah, Ulysses. It's a very difficult book to read. I actually, I, I admit that I read it within a course. So I was, I was guided through this book. Um, I read, I read the whole book in one semester, right? So, it's, yeah. and 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 um, it's a very difficult book. But it's, it's maybe it's true that it's everywhere. But that's the beauty of it. Okay. It's, it's about everything in life uh, that one can imagine in one, in one, in one book. Which, which leads me actually to think of Virginia Woolf, who had a great influence on me and still does. Uh, Sylvia Plath. Um, what, what about Virginia Woolf? Ah, oh, Virginia Woolf. Well, I think that, you know, today as a woman, um, as a feminist, as someone that wants to lead an independent life, I... No, I, she she was maybe the first unknown feminist or right. one of the first, uh, you know, because um, she 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 always said that for someone to be heard, for a writer to be heard, he has to be a man, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know that the um, and and I think that she 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 was able to present these feminist ideas. Um, at an age where, when, when women did not write and um, did not have their, a room of their own. Right. And um, I, I think there's something so amazing also about reading her work because today there's a lot of things that we take for granted. Right. To really understand how, um, how many barriers there truly was exactly um, before, and I think it also makes you very much appreciate the present, which exactly. we sometimes don't realize how how well things are today and how how much opportunity is open, right? Com exactly com compared I mean, to the past, she's she she really uh, put forth ideas that today we would, you know, we would fight for. Um, we still do in a way, um, 
Of at, course, at the there's, time still, where, there's yeah, still always still a on. little bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's still always a push for progress. Yes. Yes. Right. right. But I think it's uh, it is good to know how far we've come. And just no, absolutely, even, absolutely. Even I, if there's more, more, uh, more to go. I think another thing about Virginia Woolf that's magical is her ability to convey pain. She was a very unhappy person. Uh, you know, she was not. She, her ending was 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 tragic, um, and uh, and um, it's true also for Sylvia Plath. And I think this ability to to convey, you know, these the, the, the deepest, yeah, yeah, the deepest uh, anxieties uh, and 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 you know, a certain sense of insanity, right? Of 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 this this ability to to put in words the 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 process of going mad in a way, yeah, of being so desperate to uh, show you how that unfolds in a way, yeah, yeah. and it it can only be done with words, <laughs> right. Right, right. No, it's amazing how mm. words at the end of the day can really uh, transport you, and they can uh, allow you to experience all of these, all of these different conditions of being human, just from sitting down and reading. Right. Yes. There are so many places you can go. Uh, exactly. Like, like Doctor Seuss said. <laughs> right. True. So okay. So to to conclude, I have two questions for you. So first of all, you know the podcast is called The Bigger Picture. And the bigger picture uh, for me is basically a way of looking at the world, right? It's having a zoomed out perspective. It's also looking deeper into things and finding the, the meaning behind things and maybe not getting caught up in the details, but really seeing the, the grander vision behind something. And so I think that for all of us, we have our own personal bigger picture of our lives and how we see our lives, what impact we want to have. So that's, that's the first question. I want to know what your personal bigger picture is of your life. And second, the bigger picture of your work. We talked about the studies and, you know, the different, the different conclusions that you found, but I want to know what, what the bigger picture is, right, for you of this work, what you hope that this work, work will accomplish and what kind of footprint you hope it leaves in the world? So I think that, um, I think I can actually, I think that my answer, again on two levels, is that both, both questions have the same answer. In other words, I can, it's very difficult for me today to separate my personal um, uh, ambitions um, from my professional ones, or in other words, um, you know, I think that I think that the realization that the you know the the universities is no longer this ivory tower. Mm -hmm. It's it's a place um, in which we carry out research in order to be able to apply it to the real world. Um, in order to to make a difference. So you know, for example, the I'll, I'll start from the end. You know, the research. The research on on the noun verbs. Um, if the next step is is to turn it into an intervention or to actually apply this knowledge, you know, in in the real world, um, and and to actually, it, it's so easy. You know, I, I don't need money for this. I can I just have to talk about it to the right people, and and in hope that they will actually make use of it. So so I would say that. You know, it's 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 and it's personal because because I want our reality to change because I think that you know talking about bigger picture, I think that living in a world of conflict is so out of date. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's it's, it's a so two thousand. It's so yeah. It's it's it, it's it's something that uh, you know we we should no longer be in, and uh, so so I feel that. You know, although the research is totally and 100% scientific, I'm doing it because on a personal level, I want something to change. I want a reality to change. So, so I think my answer is, is you know, is, is, is I have the same answer for both questions. Um, I think, um, I think when you, the fact that you have the same answer for both questions just goes to show that 
you're doing what you're passionate about. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's, there's nothing more significant in our life than doing uh, what we're more, most passionate about. And, 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 you know, feeling that if we can change something somewhere, sometime, then, um, then, then, then there's a reason for, for being here. You know, it's, it's, I know that it's not popular to say, to say this because, you know, people is, Think, may think that you know the reason we're here is in order to to populate the world and 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 right the, clear- the nihilistic evolutionary kind yes, of perspective yes 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 and and clearly you know the most important thing in my life is my family but um but but everything that we're doing we're doing because you know of of this family right of of this uh, immediate family and 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 bigger family, right. larger family, and wanting the world to be a better place for for that family. Exactly. Ex- sounds you know a bit uh, utopic and um, naive, but uh, it's I it's, think it's hopeful. It's the only where it's the only way. Um, no, absolutely. Think. I think you know there's a there's a quote: optimists and pessimists uh, die the same. <laughs> Right. So, so at the end of the day, just having an optimistic point of view and believing that you can make a difference, right? Even if it's uh, in your just immediate circle, just exactly. having that intention of doing good. And also, even though it's not popular because we, we're living in a bit of a nihilistic world, I think bringing back meaning into our lives is so important and finding exactly. finding that meaning for yourself. Exactly. You want to feel that you your life has meaning. You want to provide meaning to others. Um, and and that, that gives a lot of hope and strength. And uh, it's the only, th- I, I think these positive, positive attitude is what's going to make the world a better place, obviously, right? Uh, there is no other way. Right. And on the individual level, if we all, we all subscribe to that, right? To that optimism, to that uh, intention of doing good. Then the world will have no choice but to exactly. <laughs> to improve. But I, I really think that those changes do happen on a personal level of people adopting that that optimism, that hope, and taking the responsibility of of making that difference uh, in the little ways that they can. Right. Yeah. It has a ripple effect. Absolutely. Thank you for that inspiring message, Oli, and for telling us so much about psycholinguistics and this. You're very welcome. Fascinating, fascinating field. Uh, So thank you. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. To everyone out there listening, thank you for tuning in to the Bigger Picture podcast. I hope you found this conversation interesting. You can find us on all podcasting platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to hit subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. My name is Roni Firon. This is The Bigger Picture. Thank you for listening. Till next time.